Um, as part of our uh, theme uh, for this uh, third PERC symposium, we've developed much more the idea of now mobilizing the technologies and the platforms that have been developed over the last few years. And so uh, we are now going to have a workshop with some of the industrial partners that are part of our industry advisory group, and that's going to be run by Chris Barker. Chris has joined us uh, recently um, at, as the Director of Research and Business Development for PERC. Uh, many of you know him well because he was previously the CSO uh, at our um, uh, partner organization, uh, Genome Prairie, and, and we all work with him very closely writing grant applications and um, linking up, in fact, with industrial partners. Um, he's a microbiologist by training, but he, uh, he's um, mutated over the years, as they say, and uh, um, worked with a number of companies, including Biostar and Metamorph um, um, Metamorphics in the, in the past. So uh, we're very pleased that uh, Chris has joined us, and uh, those of you who are part of the industrial uh, group that are now becoming more associated with PERC will know that he's uh, really begun to uh, turn the ideas of these partnerships into reality. So Chris, uh, I'll invite you to the, to the podium and then you can uh, sort out the panel and uh, get them introduced. So we're going to have this as, as very much an open discussion and uh, an opportunity to, to ask questions and not so much about uh, about the science, but about turning that science into utility. Uh, we're all here uh, ultimately to improve agricultural productivity and, and feed the world in our own little way. Uh, the, the groups represented here um, uh, are in a point where the, the seed meets the soil in a different spot than, than most of the researchers in the room. Uh, they work uh, a lot quite directly with, uh, with primary producers. Uh, we used to call them farmers. Um, but uh, um, they're going to uh, share their experiences from, from the other side of the world uh, in terms of actually commercializing and selling these products to the wider world. Um, one last thing I'd like to mention, they all represent different organizations. Uh, they all have jobs within those different organizations, but they're representing their own opinions uh, any lawyers in the room, uh, they're just talking about the things that they think about. They're not representing any company positions, just, uh, just for clarity on that. Uh, so if you could all just start with a quick introduction of who you are and what you do. Katty. Hello, everybody. My name is Katty. I am the developmental breeding lead with Cargill Global Geos, which is Cargill Global <laughs> Edible Oils. Uh, my main responsibility is developing uh, parental inbred lines for the hybrid uh, commercial pipeline. Um, the main focus of our breeding program is modifying the fatty acid profile to enhance the performance of the frying oil and also the uh, consumer health. One thing that I'm really excited about in my breeding program is to find the link between genomics and phenomics to help enhance the genetic gains and um, speed up the si um, breeding cycles. So maybe that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my name is Devin Dubois. I'm uh, one of the owners and uh, chief operating officer for a, a, a company called Fieldalytic Solutions Canada. We provide a geospatial um, geospatial tool for production agriculture, uh, generally not at the producer level, but at the agronomy level. Uh, so we supply the digital tools to uh, agronomists and all sorts of different organizations throughout Canada, um, input suppliers, uh, equipment dealers, independent agronomy companies. Uh, we're the platform that allows them to collect sort of any nature of information digitally uh, and do what they will with it. Um, primarily our platform is really deep on uh, fertility analysis and recommendations bills based on sort of anything. Um, topography, soil removal rates, um, subsurface conditions, uh, you name it, yield, uh, it, it's all there. So we do that and um, the same uh, people in that business, we are now also into industrial hemp production. Um, and so we now are involved in uh, the production and processing of industrial hemp for both food uh, and, and other purposes. So um, 
Yeah, we're, 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 we're close to the field, we're close to the ground. Uh, we deal primarily in, in Western Canada, Canadian prairies, but we're, we're now into Ontario and Quebec in, in a way as well, so. Good afternoon, my name is David Yi, and I'm the Vice President of Saskatchewan Operations for PAMI, or Prairie Agricultural Machinery Institute. Uh, we're here, and you'll see a booth of ours. We represent two brand names. One is PAMI, which is, reports to the Ministry of Agriculture, so we're a government-based organization. But we also carry a second brand name called West Test, and that's an industry-led organization. Both of them are nonprofits. What's interesting about us is that we started in 1971 out of a royal commission and became into being in 1975. And what that royal commission did was that it determined that there needed to be an organization in Canada that would be able to even out the balance between the farmers or the producers and also the ag OEMs. So our history is inside of ag, it's inside of machinery. And what we've done in that time in the last 42 years is we expanded into oil and gas, into mining, we have a real strong attachment still to our original mandate to agriculture. And what makes us also very compelling and value added in that situation is that we do not, as an organization, connect to IP or want to own IP, and we do not have an ability to commercialize. So it makes us a real good integration partner. And I'm uh, Jamie Denbo, one of the global digital ag leads for Farmer's Edge. Uh, I have immediate responsibility for Canada, the United States, Ukraine, and Russia. Um, so uh, Farmer's Edge, uh, as a company, uh, we're kind of a full service um, agronomy support, uh, data acquisition, data management, and data analysis company. And essentially work, we work directly with growers, helping them make deci uh, decisions to drive their uh, productivity and profitability, uh, as well as uh, uh, I guess the first step is to install a full digitization of the farm, so uh, automated field-centric data collection uh, across the farm, and of course build that into layers that can be laid over top of each other to analyze, to make more micro decisions, to, uh, to make better decisions and, and drive productivity. So in a nutshell, that's uh, who we are. We are based out of the five major agricultural areas of the world, so we're currently Canada, the US, uh, Brazil, Australia, and Ukraine, Russia. Um, and we actually have uh, an agreement with Planet Labs uh, for access to daily uh, high resolution imagery, uh, essentially in every agricultural region of the world. So it's a little bit, a bit about ourselves. Okay, last but not the least, my name is Masood Rizvi. And, uh, those who know me, uh, I'm coming from Canola and I work for Cortivo AgriSciences. Uh, Cortivo AgriSciences is, uh, is a new uh, group of, or division of, agriculture division of uh, newly merged uh, Dow DuPont. Uh, merger happened last year. Um, so my role is on uh, corn and I live in uh, Saskatoon. So mm -hmm. you can see my title is Discovery Lead. Uh, one of the factor is how this all the technology which is available now in terms of genetics, genomics, or gene editing, or you say like soil health or ag, uh, prediction agriculture, we are trying to build upon the, those technology and trying to do something uh, for the corn to grow in an in unfavorable condition, which is Canada. All right, okay, thank you very much. So that's the panel. Uh, I've got a few questions to, uh, to get the conversation going, but uh, if anybody in the audience has any questions, I think there's a couple of microphones out there. You, Morris, you have one? Okay. Uh, so uh, anybody uh, have any questions for this panel, just, just uh, please stand up and we'll try and get you a microphone to give you a chance. Uh, but to just get the uh, creative juices flowing, um, First of all, without considering the, the PERC program, uh, where do you see the long-term and short-term opportunities to use data collection and mining in the ag industry? It's just completely off the top of your head. Where do you think the opportunities are? Devin. Um, <clears throat> I think there are different opportunities for different audiences. Uh, I think, you know, there's some obvious uh, constituents uh, like the commodity, you know, commodity buying and selling industry, uh, the insurance industry, finance, who are interested in, in, in macro information. Um, 
and they're interested in you know uh, predictability in sort of broad strokes uh, for different crop varieties, crop types, what's coming. Um, sometimes that's going to be correlated. You know, they want to see what's correlated with climatic conditions and and how that's going to vary. Um, I guess from my perspective and our perspective, we're more interested in, and, and I mean that information will be available, um, and it's already becoming available, and I think if it's not fed from production upward, uh, those companies are going to find a way to find the information they want through other means, right? Whether it's satellite imagery, um, other kinds of, you know, I, I mean, there will be ways that they get that macro information. I think from the production side of the equation, um, we're getting to a point where producers are starting to understand that the value in their information is actually, the most value is, is for them as producers. Um, and if they change their perspective to viewing and assessing and analyzing production, both sort of agronomically and, and economically, on a spatial level, subfield level, we're talking about every small piece of dirt, just like, um, you know, the scientists in this room, you know, the unit of concern is, is, is the plant and inside the plant, the, the genetic material that belongs to that plant that displays certain properties. Um, I think if we can move producers to the notion that they need to, to, to view production on a spatial plane, that, um, that we're going to see them engage in, in a very effective way with, with micro information, if you want to call it that, or small scale data, right? A subfield level for their own fields they're going to start to, you know, find value in, in seeing, you know, where they're productive and where they're not. It's where those things meet that will be really interesting um, because producers are saying, you know, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? I'm pretty sure that all of you are just stealing my information and doing something nefarious with it, which, you know, I, there may be some element of truth there, but, you know, people sort of on, on, at the larger level, um, you know, um, crop seed development companies, chem, chem development companies, in the same way, they want to see that mass accumulation of information come from the producers upward so they, they can actually assess what works and what doesn't work, so they can actually provide products that are going to work better for producers. So there's, there's kind of a, a, a tit for tat on, on you know, who's contributing to the data pool and who's accessing the data pool for what purposes. And I think there's good purpose for everybody, both producers and, and, and developers of, of ag technology. Um, but I think we're just starting to come to a, a, a space where both sides of the equation are comfortable with that and finding ways to meet in the middle. All right. Caddy, you seem to be nodding there. You're agreeing. We'll find somebody that's disagreeing with you, but um, you know, just carry well, on. Well, I just want to add one quick uh, comment. Speaking of data, I, uh, I think uh, digitalization and analytics is starting to become a trend that the ag industry is, is moving towards. And I think Cargill is a really good example of that. You guys in this room might know Cargill as a giant grain trading company. But we are going through a kind of a cultural shift um, to, to, to see the value in the data and the analytics. And um, you spoke of the satellite imagery. And um, it's interesting that Cargill started a partnership with a, a startup company in 2016 called Descartes Lab, who is a, um, a bunch of very smart computer scientists uh, based in uh, downtown Santa Fe, and they're ba basically taking the dirty uh, satellite imagery and turning it into uh, something that's ready to be analyzed. And uh, the Cargill agricultural supply chain has, has, has seen the value in it to help um, define a strat a strategic plans. So um, anyway, my point is that the ag industry is moving towards applying um, all these novel and new technologies out there. Any other philosophical comments here? I don't know if it's philosophical or not, but I think uh, primarily, you know, both short term and long term, it's about uh, risk mitigation. Um, you know, they, they know that on average their inputs are going to cost them between 1% and 3% more next year than they were this year. That's just basic economics, right? So uh, knowing that, how can we utilize data, analyze data to Maybe we don't even change anything on the farm. Maybe we still grow the same acres. Maybe we still grow the same three canola hybrids because we've got canola people in, in front. But by managing data, we place those hybrids better or treat them differently to drive up our production. And it's really just about uh, a risk management or a risk mitigation. 
Yeah, I just want to add uh, about the farmers here. We are talking, I think they are aware, like they were do collecting the data from last 20 years, 25 years. They have a historical data and they transfer it to generation to generation. But now they are more aware. They, they really want some decision making tool, which can really, as he mentioned, about the mitigating some of the problems they have uh, about the abiotic or biotic stresses. Right, okay. I haven't heard anything said about this thing. I know my, my ST panel members, they, they, and, and what we can see in the news, and, and what we're seeing in a lot of the publications about commercialization of data, uh, a lot of that paradigm has come out. But I'm really interested about something that just came out, and it came out from uh, uh, Dr. Smith and what he's talking about. And it's the interest about this particular group being able to utilize the data that you guys are getting involved in in, very, in a very big and a very deep way and how you're gonna take back a bit of the message that we have right now and get the social license back. There's a lot of really, really powerful and really, really meaningful things that are happening here with the plant breeders and especially under the area of uh, phenomics. And uh, we haven't done a good job in the past about how we've messaged going forward, but now that we have new messages, we have new paradigms and we're breaking new horizons, how are we going to start messaging that? And what are some of the tools that we're utilizing in? And there are some things that I think are going on with some of the data. When I take a look at the presentations that were given this morning, that there's some really powerful messages there, and we need to take a look at that. And I know that's probably not inside the wheelhouse of researchers in general. You know, you don't think about things like marketing and that, or your part inside of the industry. But there's something in here we have to take a look at with the data. All right, actually, and, and let's drill down. If there aren't any questions, I'll keep going. Um, Let's, let's drill down into that specifically around the, the, the PERC uh, work and, and there were some great presentations uh, this morning that provided overviews of, of what's actually going on. So, so some of the research that you're seeing, where is that ready to, to, to transition into, into commercial opportunities either within, within the, the multinationals or directly on the farm? Uh, from from Pammy's perspective, we're really, really excited about some of the work that we've seen this morning, especially something like um, um, in the case of Scott Noble. And from us being a machinery institute, seeing some of these ground truthing technologies, seeing some of these mobility solutions that are going out in there. Uh, there's probably some paradigms that we would probably from Pammy want to introduce and, and, and talk about, but they're really aligning themselves in a set of requirements that are not only useful for what we're looking for in trying to find and, and collect data for the phenomics part, but we think that there's applications right all the way down to the producer. And then part of our DNA, or our, our, our genetic history is to go and take these types of technologies and look for the applications that are under areas. So I'm not sure if everybody's aware, but we have a very, very large component in terms of oil and gas in mining, and even in an area of defense and security. And uh, I've had an opportunity to talk to one of Dr. Scott Noble's students, and I said, you know, there's a lot of parallels between what the defense and security industry is looking for that the agricultural industry does. You guys do a lot of things extremely well that that market sector is very, very interested in. So just, just from the actual machinery application point, we see a lot of opportunities in that. We also see a lot of opportunities in some of the novel technologies that you guys are using right now in how you gather your data. And the ability for that to become a standardization model, what we're doing here in Saskatchewan, a standardization model to be able to get equipment out to people who are trying to repeat the work that you're doing. So building these types of machines, making a standardization so that the next set of phenomic breeders are looking and walking down the similar path that you are. So build on your shoulders, build on the shoulders of giants. And I, I would echo that. It's, it's, you know, we see a lot of the sensory technology that a lot of researchers are employing in order to, um, you know, evaluate their own <laughs> research projects. It's a lot of that sensory technology and the data collection um, methodology that is, is very applicable to production agriculture on, on a broad scale fairly quickly. And it's just identifying where some of those opportunities were asked for sort of immediate deployment in a, in a commercial capacity. And I think it's there and I, I you know, Sometimes it's just facilitating conversations to figure out, um, you know, what the needs are in production agriculture and, and where the translation can be made. Because um, it's very much, very much the same kind of analysis that, man, there's some sensory technologies and methodologies that, uh, you know, researchers are using that are highly applicable to broad 
acre agriculture. The other thing to understand is the way that broad acre ag agriculture has moved. It probably has some advice and um, benefit to the research community as well. To understand that you know, the equipment that's being deployed in the field um, now on a broad scale agriculture is a lot of times as sophisticated in many ways as some of the research tools that you're trying to use, build, employ. Um, and I, I think the research community would do well to start looking at production agriculture and the tools people are employing now in order to rob. Uh, and one of the things that uh, you know, I've been saying, and I think we're making some headway as well, is that with digitization of, of the farms and, and digitization of production agriculture, um, suddenly your potential for trial work <laughs> has grown. Um, when the, the, these bits of land become digitized in a somewhat understandable, uniform fashion, there is a lot of, you know, I, I don't know how precise and exact some of the scientific trial work, you know, I, I know it's not sort of the absolute nature that, that you want in controlled experimentation, but in terms of understanding whether certain things work, including uh, certain genetic you know, varieties, how well they perform under certain conditions. Now that producers are digitizing their production on, on a spatial level, um, there's opportunity to leverage what they're doing and I would say producers want to be involved. They want to know if this stuff works. They want to know if what you're developing is truly functional. And I guess sort of from some of our experience, the way that you know, your good research has made it to producer level trials, Historically, by the time it hits producer-level trials through the hands of, uh, you know, uh, the chem, fertilizer, seed development companies, those, it, it, it falls apart, or historically it has. And, and those producer field-level trials have generally been questionable. The opportunity is there now to re-engage producers um, in real field-scale trial, and it's not as complicated anymore as it, as it once was. And I think researchers should think about that. Well, uh, this is uh, the third uh, PERC symposium and I've been to all of them and I, I want to echo that it's really exciting to see um, all the fantastic research that's going on in PERC and I can uh, just be quick and summarize it in, in three areas that uh, all these technologies are going to be helpful in the ag industry. One is uh, helping the farmers understand their microenvironments. Uh, the, the soil components and the, the half of the plant that's under the ground and we never look at it. The other piece is helping the breeders. They always want fast, a lot of it, and accurate data. And um, I can see all these data collection te uh, technologies are going to be very helpful for them. And also for the seed producers to, um, I mean the seed companies, to benefit from the prediction models of yield and not maybe just species specific models. Maybe we can shoot for this guy and talk about variety specific uh, prediction models. Yeah, sure. I will echo about the progress of P2IRC because uh, same thing, I am attending the symposium from last three years and every time I go, phenomenal progress. So that's a really a, a big landmark, uh, having in Saskatoon and doing, uh, because we have a short season, we have to accept that. Even if we don't accept that, uh, when we go to the warmer areas. But yeah, we have a short season, for sure. So um, like uh, as, as you mentioned about the multinational companies, I think multinational companies really are the data-driven. And uh, the, another point is they're really trying to keep the quality and then if you see uh, most of the breeders spend like uh, days and days to collect those data, uh, these kind of technology can really uh, help them to speed up the, the data process. But what I'm just looking now, there are some uh, low-hanging fruits, but there are some activity where we need to really redefine. I Means it's always good to review, modify, and redefine. I know like a park uh, tagline is really good, progress, target, and engagement. But with the engagement, it's a good idea to go back, modify, review, and refine our goals. So it can be applicable much quicker than 
uh, what what we are planting. So that's my comment. J Jamie, I know this is a very first time for you, and you haven't been involved in, in uh, PTIRC uh, before. Uh, so I'm really interested to get your thoughts, particularly as, as what you saw was this morning, and that's about it. Yeah, no, uh, great. So um, I probably have a little bit different opinion, just kind of due to the, the size and scale of the business that, that we're operating in. Um, and it probably depends on your de definition of now, too. So. <laughs> Um, being in the tech side now is kind of within the, if it was within the next six months. But if you're, uh, I guess if now is within the next five years, I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing. Um, you look at the capability, I'll just throw a, a hypothetical situation at you here. Uh, we know now using the, the data that I've seen today, we know the hyperspectral signature of um, pick a weed, let's say wild oats. Uh, right now, growers are spraying their crop for wild oats. Well, we shouldn't be spraying crop for wild oats. We should be spraying wild oats for wild yeah. oats, right? So if we can run through something that's automated and, and very scalable, like satellite imagery, you know, we're delivering 20 to 22 million acres of satellite imagery daily right now, uh, and be able to apply a filter which shows growers exactly where wild oats are, are on their farm, they drive their efficiency in applications of wild oat herbicides up by, I don't know, pick a number, 70%. Um, you know, huge opportunity to drive uh, efficiency of, of applications. Chris, I want to defend this room a little bit. But as, um, our belief at PAMI and my belief is that what you guys bring to the table is discovery science. What happens in the next six weeks is not where your best value is. We need you to do what you've always been doing and really pushing that outside horizon. This is about the future of what we're going to be in five, seven, 10, 15 years from now. So you know, uh, apologies to my panelists. There's a lot of companies and there's a lot of vendors who are working on the next month, the next six months, the next year. But what we really look for you guys for direction and leadership in is on that far horizon. That's where I think you guys really can shine. Right. So leads to the obvious question, how do we bridge that gap? You know, how do we take what's going on in here with the, with the researchers uh, in this room and get it into your collective hands uh, for <coughs> delivering to, to your companies and uh, to farmers? Thoughts? Masood. I will say, uh, yeah, I, I was knowing you will pick me. Uh, <laughs> like, I would say more engagement. And uh, that, that's this kind of symposium is really helping out. Like, uh, I'm always excited about looking forward for the symposium to really know more about what is going on and where we are at. So, yeah, more engagement. I think, um, and I'm speaking from experience, I think in our... Um, collaborations between industry and uh, academia. We are really good in defining uh, questions and making a plan to find a solution. But maybe what still remains to be the gap is the timeline. The pace that the academia is going through is, is a little different from the pace that industry is going through. And I think we need to um, to work together um, because we have really smart problems to solve. Let's work together, be aligned on those timelines. And if I may, I would like to add another point that I totally understand that uh, the, the main objective of academia is training students. But one part of training the students could be exposing them to the to the work environment in a private industry um, environment. Um, and, I, and I think th this is not in contradiction to what um, the industries are looking for when it comes to talent recruitment. So I think we are all sharing the same goals, having the same questions. We are just approaching it differently, which I like to see one day that we look at it from the same lens. <laughs> I think from a practical perspective, I mean, so um, we've got some experience trying to sort of uh, bridge this gap. Um, 
It, it turns out you can't just walk into a university and find a professor who's like a subject area expert and say, hey, I've got an issue, I'd like to pay you some money to solve it. Um, apparently, from the industry perspective, that seems like a very reasonable thing to do. From the academic institution perspective, apparently that's it's not how things are done. So, um, so it took a little while to, to learn that, and, and gradually, you know, we've made some inroads. Um, and when you you make the right friends, um, and then suddenly, you, you know, you might get the odd ear. One of the things that you know, I guess, maybe tries to bridge the gap are, are governments and funding agencies, right, that are funding research. Um, and you know, historically, we've seen uh, you know governments. I mean, the political institutions they like to advertise that they're doing good things uh, for certain industries and certain. Um, subject matters, so they've got all these funding programs. Um, a lot of that funding uh, structure is really geared to funding academic research. It really seems to be um, tailored to that environment, to that community, to that culture, the way that that funding works. So when it comes to, you know, we're a small company, so sort of SME, small medium enterprise, SME and business speak. Um, I think we've been very uninvolved historically in development because um, we just haven't been a part of that community and we've really had no way in. When you go to those funding agencies and say, hey, we've got a really interesting problem in production agriculture and we have some glimmer of an idea how to solve it, they say, well, that would be really great. Could you go talk to an expert about solving that and come back to us when you've got a qualified expert, which you know, is, is, is academics who are recognized in the field, published and everything else. So <clears throat> I think Perk has helped us make some inroads there by connecting us, small medium enterprises, with some academic experts in fields and saying, look it, we think these guys actually do have an interesting problem to solve. They've got some interesting ideas how to do it, and they need your participation to vet that out, and also to engage the levels of government and the funding agencies who are actually interested in actually trying to fund and solve problems in the space. Um, so, I, I don't know exactly how you go about that, except to say that I guess this agency happened to put some of us together in the right room so that we could start having those conversations and say, look, it, you guys have some really interesting technology. Uh, we've got some interesting problems, and we've got a bit of a solution that we think might work. How do we put it together, right? And if you're you know, Cargill or Bayer, I mean, you may have a whole development program with qualified, very qualified people in the program. When you have small and medium enterprises with schmucks like me, um, you know, you need somehow to escalate and connect, you know, real production needs to uh, some bright people who can help you solve that and, the, and, and then the resources to do it. So I think we're starting to get there and I, I, think, um, I think, you know, we've made some really good connections with some really awesome people in, in the university community here who I think really do want to be helpful and really do want to help solve some of these <laughs> tangible problems, um, which doesn't mean that they shouldn't do pure research and they're still doing it but they're starting now to convey some of that into a real functional solution. So it's kind of our story on this, but we're getting there. I'll, I'll maybe add my perspective from the new guy on the board. So um, <laughs> um, I'm actually seeing some of the connection actually happening already in the last year to year and a half with the development of the super clusters uh, by Ag Canada. That's a big step forward. Uh, even looking at the four tiers or four pillars that we went through this morning. Um, you know, with that last pillar being, okay, now we have the technology, how do we drive Im implementation to the broad acre farm, which let's face it, folks in the room, all our checks are kind of issued by the broad acre farm. Um, all the, the money from the industry comes from the broad acre farm. So I think, you know, that, that fourth step or the fourth uh, pillar is really about that connection point of, of how do we uh, make it scalable and bring it to bring it to the masses. Right. Masud, we've. There's a question there. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I have a question back here. Um, I mean, just. Is it? Oh yeah. Okay. So, a uh, question about the connection. Um, Jamie, not to pick on you, I think you have a, a great service, but I was recently out with my uncle who uh, checking crop with the, the farmer's edge and his network is a 3G. He has one bar on the edge of the farm and literally everything was at his fingertips, but he couldn't connect to it. This morning we saw, you know, amazingly high resolution imagery and science and that is such a 
a far scale, I guess, to get from there. Um, and every one of you is probably going to have kind of that issue of getting from super finite science to producers, large scale, in the middle of nowhere, and then moving forward in developing countries. I think this would be a good, making sure that our farmers here have access to this will just help make this a worldwide kind of science. So. You, you probably brought up two, uh, two problems in, in, in that question. So first of all, the whole 3G thing and the fact that 3G is going to go away, uh, go away and a lot of uh, everyone's networks are built on 3G. So that's something we're already working on fixing. And the second thing from your uncle's perspective, we probably need to get out there and, and do some training with them because we have an app that does not require cell signal at all. So he downloads all the maps into the app and then goes to the field without cell connection. Uh, doesn't require anything, so. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. You, you, okay, well, I, I, and to sort of follow that up, I, you know, looking back, like we've been involved in a similar sector here for close to eight or nine years, and I think one of our faults when it came to engaging producers and one of maybe the shortcomings of production agriculture, and I'll put some of this on the OEM manufacturers as well, <laughs> When they started producing like variable rate application and seeding technology, it was like, boom, this variable rate technology is out there. And then producers said, well, what are we supposed to do with it? There was a whole agronomic and input advising community who was not functioning on, on the necessary level in order to employ that kind of technology, but suddenly this technology was thrown out. And so early, some early adopters like us said, well, variable rate, this is the answer, this is the answer, this is the answer. And we were perplexed at why nobody employed it, but nobody came to producers with a really simple sort of explanation of, of sort of the, the foundation, the why of this, which is um, that your production, both agronomically and economically, you need to measure it on the right metric, right? And manage it on the right metric. And it, it turns out there's a better metric than either the field level or the crop level or, you know, uh, the farm level. You go to, say these accountants or farm advisors, what are they still doing? They're still measuring, helping these producers and telling these producers that they're being measured on a, at minimum, or sorry, at sort of the smallest level on a field level, but generally they're measuring their performance by crop or by farm. And they're saying, well, you know, this year on your canola, you, you know, you made 4% margin. If you really dialed into their information, if their information is digitized and they're actually looking at this on a spatial level, you'll find that actually most of their fields could be profitable, but there's usually about anywhere from 5 to 15% of the acres subfield level are unprofitable. And it could be as simple as not doing anything on those acres, and suddenly you've taken their farm from a, you know, 3% margin to like a 10% margin on canola, if that's how you want to measure it. But the problem is there's a whole support industry around the producers that we're not measuring this properly either and they didn't understand the move to spatial. So what was their input supplier telling them? What was their accountant telling them? What was their financial person telling them? That's the problem, right? Um, you can throw software in front of a farmer all day long, and it, it means very little to any of them, unless they understand the foundation, and the people who are supporting them and advising them understand the foundation of changing how you manage and how you analyze your performance in agriculture. And, and, and I mean, that's why our theory is, we're trying to provide the tools and the influence to the people who are providing the advice because we think that's how this is going to change, right? Uh, producers don't produce alone. They've got an equipment supplier, they've got an accountant, they've got an input supplier. Uh, they may be involved in field trials, they've got chem reps coming out. There's a community of people. The community of people need to understand how to measure this better so that we can do better. And the technology exists to do this. It's all out there. The farmer's edge, that's technology that will do this. Our technology will do this. We've done a poor job of explaining this to the rest of the production industry. Um, but I think we're starting to get there. We're starting to get there. Got uh, questions? Yeah, go ahead. I truly appreciate the, the, the information and what you're trying to do, to do to, for us to share more information with the producers. The other, on the other hand, it's very hard to get information from them. So they have the state-of-the-art equipments. They have the John Deere tractor, which equipped with everything you can imagine. They share the information with John Deere, but they would never share it with us. So how are we going to help them 
improve their systems where we can't get the data? That, that, that is an awesome question. And I, I would love to deliver you all the data all day long. And I, we fight, I, this is a very personal thing for me because, uh, I, and I hate to admit this, but anyway, I'm a lawyer by trade and I'm trying to get over that and forget about it and <laughs> be done with it. But we've, I have been in this conversation with so many producers and it's very aggravating. Um, I do want to respect data privacy, I get that. I get that people feel you know, their information is important to them. But the conversation I, I try to have with producers who are skeptical over and over and think that everyone is pilfering, right? You people generally are not pilfering people. You're people with a genuine interest in, in making things better uh, or evaluating what you do, right? You would like to see, you know, if you're involved in developing genetics, you would like to see what happens to that, right? Five years down the road. How, how, how widespread is this? Is it actually working? How does it perform different soil zones? I get it. And what I tell these, these producers, and like I say, I think we're at the forefront of changing that message, is that your information is most valuable to you, right? If you don't do anything, if you just keep saying, you know, well, an extra five bucks on nitrogen across the farm, and it seems to be paying off because my accountant says I'm making 3% margin, okay, thumbs up, right? And, but I think we're starting to get that message through that, you know what, if you put your information in the system, you can generate some real, real value for yourself. But part of putting it in the system is that it's going to go to other places in an aggregated format. Um, and, and I, <laughs> I <laughs> struggled with John Deere, because this was, again, in my past role. As they were coming into this world, working out, well, what's the right policy here, right? And this notion of aggregated data, I think, has become sort of generally adopted in the industry, saying, well, you know, yeah, your information is special and whatever, because there are only, whatever, 200,000 other people growing spring wheat, so sure, you're special. You're not special, <laughs> but you think you're special. Secondly, yeah, you know what? If Bayer wants to know what's growing on your field this season, they can figure out what's growing on your field this season. You don't have to give it to them, they know. So I'm starting to change, trying to change that conversation so that people are less guarded about this. You can raise things like, well, what about your banking, right? Your banking information seems pretty valuable. Nobody really says, you know, well, what's the bank doing with my information? Credit reporting agencies, they've got all your information. People don't question this. It's because this is a new frontier, right, for producers. This is new to them. They're paranoid. And it's a communication effort to change that so that people like you can access the information because systems like us, we're happy to work with whatever, however we can with aggregated data. If you're doing something useful or want to do something useful, the biggest return is going to be to give it back to the growers because some of them are starting to understand now that the only way I can tell you whether, you know, B258 canola performs better on loamy clay than it does on, you know, sandy clay is if we have an aggregated pool of information so that we can make that assessment. And if everybody starts putting some information in, well, guess what? We can give them the ana analytics that they want and tell them, right? What, what, so we're with you. I think as a data industry, we're with you. Um, Frankly, I'm not in a data industry. I've never sold a bit of data. I've never commercialized a bit of data. For us, it's been about trying to make our tool better for the users who are using the tool, and that's kind of the deal we have with them, so. Chris, if it's okay, I just want to address two things. So the first thing is for the young gentleman in the back. I'm sure that when he came to actually a research conference, he never thought that he would ask a question that would get a lawyer all wound up. But uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't have a solution for current problems right now in the next six days, the next six months. But one thing I just wanted to, for, for everybody in the room, especially for you, if, if everybody just wants to keep a watching brief on it, we certainly have, and, and I've kept in, in contact and actually have talked to the people. There was a young gentleman who actually spent two summers here in a farm near Estevan. And that young gentleman went on to actually start a company, a car company that went into uh, electrification. And uh, if you've been watching the news lately, he's actually walking away from that particular company. But he's actually made a big bet. It's a $10 billion bet on another company. And that company is called Space. SpaceX. And in 2018, Falcon Heavy put three launches inside of there. They're averaging about 30 to 40 launches, uh, primarily for the satellite and communication industry and also for defense. But he put three launches up, and specifically, those three launches had his first prototypes on FCC satellites. So these are small, low Earth orbit satellites, or LEO. Uh, satellites. They're part of, and please Google this, take a look at the, the information on it, the Starlink constellation. And when the Starlink constellation comes through, and he's, he's, he's betting right now that it'll be about mid-2020s, he is offering, and right now, from the Colorado station, 
on the eight satellites that are currently orbiting around at 710 miles orbit, they're able to achieve 25 millisecond turnaround time. What that means for everybody is that that is equivalent to broadband network when you're sitting at your home and you're plugging in your laptop. So there is this technological solution. One of the problems we do have is as we move discovery science, sometimes technology and other variables that need to come along with it aren't there. But we're, we're talking about something within about you know, seven to eight years that could possibly be there to help that. So hopefully that's something to look forward to. I don't have an answer. I think this gentleman has an answer right now. <laughs> but, but on the second one, and, and back to an earlier question, what it was about is that you know, how, do we, how do we find the methodology to move forward and start to make the connections? And, and I think one of the things that we're seeing is that you know, there's been mention of about the PIC supercluster. So there's been some really good things. You know, you guys bringing up a panel and having some people who are more tied with industry is, is, is a recognition. I think this particular gentleman over here, and the kind of work that he's done, and he's actually come and talked to us. So Chris Barker, and the way that he's thinking, this will help. But for us at PAMI, what we really look at is we look at you and the institutions you represent and what your mandate is, which is in the HQP. And what we need to do is we need to find the door so we can develop a sandbox that we can all work in. And once we start finding that sandbox and what we work in, we can find what your needs are and what our needs are, we can find integration, we can find collaboration. So for our particular model, which we've been using, we've been talking to people here and we've been talking to people around the universities, is that we're looking at your students, we're looking at your MAs, we're looking at your PhDs and your postdocs. And we think that we have an integrative model, but I think industry and all of these people do, they have an integrative model to get you guys involved inside of industry. And there is commonality in purpose. And that's one thing we shouldn't forget. We do have commonality in purpose. And I think you know, one of the things I hear all the time is that research doesn't do that. No, the researchers who I meet on a regular basis, they do care about what happens to producers. They do care about what happens to farms. And they darn well do care about what happens in food and in the food supply system. So let's not lose the perspective about that, but let's look to the commonality that we have. Let's start building sandboxes that have good open front doors with re good engagement rules that we can all collaborate. Thank you, David. Uh, you know, I think we could have uh, talked for a couple hours on this, this topic, but I think we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, the panel will be here uh, the rest of the day and tomorrow uh, if you want to... Uh, uh, jump on them with, with any other questions and, and just engage. And, and that's what we're about here is, is uh, connecting uh, the research community, the industry community. And with that, uh, we'll wrap up the panel and last word to Morris. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Chris, for running this uh, interesting workshop. We've not done this uh, before, and I think uh, it's clearly something that we have to do again. Our panel members, by the way, are also part of our industry advisory group. And so I leave you with an epithet from one of the gurus of, uh, of agricultural biotechnology, Jerry Calder, and it kind of relates a little bit to what Cathy said. Uh, Jerry always says, the problem with instant gratification is it's just too slow and I think uh, you know Katie's point about uh, timelines is, uh, is one that we especially in academia need to take seriously thanks a lot all right well thank thank the panel please